very interesting interview setup or the cinematic corporate interview setup. I think that's what internet currently is about and I think it's a skill that you should master. And today's video is going to be all about me trying to convey why I shoot interviews in a way that I do. I shoot a lot of professional, basically I get paid to shoot interviews. And it's a very it's a topic that's that's close to my heart because uh, I've tried to build a professional uh, production agency for the last 12 months and everything I have to thank currently f in a way of sort of affording professional cinematic cameras, professional lighting is due to me getting paid for shooting interviews. So today we're going to go over why I shoot with two cameras, why I pick the, the mics and the audio setup that I pick, why I pick certain angles, what uh, lenses I prefer, uh, how to light it, uh, why I would pick a three-point lighting over a one-point lighting most, but not all scenarios. I'm going to use a corporate interview that I shot just a couple of days ago, so, so it's going to be interesting for me as well to sort of incorporate that interview into this video and use that as a foundation to try to explain why I love shooting interviews and how you can get the most out of your interviews. Preparations maybe doesn't sound that sexy, but trust me, it's going to be what separates you from your competitors. It's going to what makes you a successful videographer. The devil is in the details and the details comes from preparation. First, make sure you do your research. You need to know about the company and the person you are interviewing. Read up on their website, call ahead and ask the questions to the person you're interviewing about the company and them. But be careful not to do the interview on that call because you also want to leave some room for the person to be sort of spontaneous on camera it will give you some better moments I also say that you should make sure that you have prepared good interview questions and rehearse before you do the actual interview it's nothing worse than being interviewed by a person reading from a paper you should know your questions by heart ensure that you understand the location and the set design so if you can't do a scout at least make your client take some photos with their phone and send them to you bring the gear needed for the situation and the situation is going to be created by your preparations your research as well as the actual location i mean if you're filming in a large location you would probably need more lights and stronger lights and if we are filming a, a mood interview in a small conference room for example Make sure that you establish a connection with the person you're interviewing. And that's also why you should rehearse your questions. That's preparations. Uh, I also made a longer guide of film production preparations. I'm gonna link it here, but also in the description. So if you want more detailed explanation on preparations, check that video out. When it comes to the camera department, I usually follow the same principles when it comes to shooting interviews. I always use at least two cameras. I always skip a focal length. I always shoot on the shadow side of the face and I always position my talent off axis. So what it means that I don't have the talent looking into the camera, but on the person that are conducting the interview. That is my typical cinematic interview setup, but I'm gonna break this down into details. I prefer to shoot interviews with a wide angle lens. Uh, the wide angle lens gives uh, a nice overview of the subject as well as the environment that the subjects are in. It sort of helps selling the environment. It can be very effectful when doing documentary work or corporate work as well, which is where I sort of shoot most of my interviews. For the ACAM, I shoot with Canon C70 on a speed booster, which just transforms more or less into a full frame camera. So for a wide angle lens on a full frame camera, my choice for a wide angle lens would be 35 mm or 50 mm, preferably with an aperture of 1.2 or 1.4. On this particular interview setup, I used the 35 mm, the L series from Canon. The second camera, also a Canon C70 on a speed booster, I went with an 85 mm L series. And the reason why I went with the 85mm is I always try to follow the rule to skip one focal length on the B cap. 
What that means is that if I pick a 35 millimeter on my A cam, I will go 85 millimeter because I'm skipping 50. But if I had a 50 millimeter on my A cam, then I would be skipping 85 and going on a 100 millimeter. 35 plus 85 or 50 plus 100. The reason why I love shooting with the Canon C70 for interviews is it has a very high dynamic range. And I think dynamic range per dollar, I think the Canon C70 is just without competition. I position my cameras on tripods and sometimes on a slider. I always position my cameras on the dark side of the face. More on this in just a bit when I go over lighting. For your typical interview setup, I don't like when the interviewee or the talent is looking into the camera. To ensure that we sort of film on the dark side, we position the interviewer or the talent between the cameras and the key light. No. You don't need a professional cinematic camera to shoot interviews or talking head videos for YouTube. But I also think it's a lie when I say that gear doesn't matter. Of course, this is a Canon C70. It's a professional cinematic camera. And I think the video quality out of the C70 is amazing. Yes, you could get the similar quality from an R5, for example, but that's the same cost. And I can shoot more or less for a full day with this one. I don't have to change battery. It never overheats. It has professional audio interface. It has C-Log2, which is a log profile with more dynamic range than your typical mirrorless cameras. Hope you liked the chapter about the camera setups and let's move on to the next one. My typical lighting setups for any interview setups and cinematic lighting is the three-point lightning. It's the most common lighting setup. I think it should be your go-to setup if you have no clue where to start. Your three-point lighting consists of a key light, a fill light, and a backlight or hair light. It's most common to position the key light 45 degrees to the side and up from your talent. It gives a little bit of a highlight on the shadow chic, which is called Rembrandt lighting. If you add more angle to your key light, it becomes moodier and darker. And if you add less angle to your key light becomes brighter on your shadow part of your face. On this specific interview, I also used a shrimp in front of my key light. And this is how I typically try to light all my interview setups and all my cinematic lighting, because it acts like a giant diffuser. It gives you a softer and more flattering light source. For this, I used a 90 centimeter soft box on top of my Aperture 600X. And I positioned this close enough to light the entire shrimp, but not that close that it just became a double diffuser on my soft box. The second light I typically set up is the backlight or the hair light, depending on where you position it. And it's usually positioned opposite to the key light. We use the hair light or backlight to separate the talent from the background because it gives a little bit of a highlight on the edge of the talent. It helps giving depth to your character. The third and last light source is called a fill light. And it's typically positioned on the opposite side of the key light. It doesn't necessarily have to be a light source. It can be as simple as a bouncer board, just to bounce the key light back into the shadow part of the face of your talent. And sometimes we need to do the opposite. And this is what I felt I needed to do on this corporate interview. So instead of adding a bouncer, something white to reflect the light, I did the opposite and added a black flag to block, to prevent light from hitting the shadow side of the face. That way I sort of made it a little bit more moody, a little bit more cinematic, which was the look I went for in this particular interview. I rarely feel I actually need to use a second light fixture for my fill light. So I prefer just to pack some bouncers and some flags. And I would even recommend to spend some money on a proper key light and some bouncer instead of sort of spreading your investments on two equal but less powerful key lights and fill lights. I deliberately left out practicals for this uh, cinematic interview breakdown because it's such a wide topic. Just to add something about it, practicals are light sources that you can see in your scene and they're usually there to both motivate the positions of our light sources as well as add to the mood of the scene. I have several upcoming videos about three-point lightning, one-point lightning, lighting in small and large spaces. So if you don't want to miss out on those future videos, please consider subscribing. But now let's move on with this video.
Somebody say that audio is half of the production and at least when it comes to interviews I would say audio is core. And to ensure we have really good audio for an interview I prefer to use a boom mic or a shotgun microphone. We rig this just out of frame as close as possible to the talent and I also try to angle it just a little bit in front of the talent. It gives a little bit more room for the talent to move during the interview. If you end up with a shotgun above their head it usually turns out a little bit bulky and muffed. My current favorite favorite microphone is the Sennheiser MKH416. It's a fairly old microphone but I like it because it always sounds good at different types of vocals. It sounds good for male bass voices as well as lighter female voices. So it's, it's a really good microphone. I actually have two of them to ensure that I have the similar audio profile if I need to boom two microphones for two people interview at the same time. Then I rig a backup microphone, a lavalier microphone, just to ensure that just in case some Something happens with the shotgun microphone audio we have some sort of backup sound. The cons of a lavalier microphone is they are fairly hard to rig properly and you often find that the talent need to rig themselves. So it's kind of hard to get a really good sound on a lavalier microphone and really good lavalier microphones are silly expensive. I recently started using 32-bit float and I used the Zoom Recorder F8N Pro. For me it's just been a game changer and I wish I made the shift to 32-bit float sooner because I it just bought me that valuable time to not having to focus on the audio levels during my interview and instead I can just spend my time focusing on actually having the interview, focusing on the person I'm interviewing. So 32-bit uh, float it's totally a game changer for me. And as it's an external recorder, we also need sort of to ensure that we can sync the audio in post-production. So I use timecode. I use timecode on the cameras and I use timecode's tentacle syncs on my Zoom recorder to sync across multiple devices. Editing an interview could be a video of its own and this video is starting to be very long. So I'm just going to give a brief overview on how I perceive an interview and how I sort of do the overview of how I edit my typical cinematic interview setup. As I mentioned before, I use tentacle syncs to ensure I have time code on both my audio files and my camera files. That makes it very easy in DaVinci Resolve and most other NLEs to sync your footage. In DaVinci Resolve, I get something called a multi-camera clip. So I just pick the angles, depending on if I had two or three or even more cameras. And the audio will always be sort of the master audio I decided. Example, if I need the backup audio from my lavalier microphones. Then when I have this master clip, the multi-cam clip in DaVinci Resolve, it's more or less about just cutting the interview footage into desired length as well as to a cohesive story in relation to the preparations and the result desired of the entire project. Once we sort of have a timeline, fully functional interview, it's about color grading and adding that final touch, that final look to get the interview looking and feeling the way it needs to feel and look desired on your preferences as well as the client's preferences and the project's outline. Then export for your desired channels and we are set to go. So to conclude this very long video, you are a hero if you are still here. Go watch this video if you want to be prepared. If you are like me, a solo creator, at least two cameras for cinematic interviews. If you are two or more, a larger team, consider using three cameras. The third camera can be really good for capturing face expressions, emotions, hand movements, and stuff like that. When it comes to audio, 32-bit float is the way of the future. So I can't stress enough how much I recommend a 32-bit float recorder. It, it purchased that uh, sort of headroom, no pun intended, when it comes to our audio. We don't have to worry, we can just give all our attention to the actual interview. Three Point Lightning is the way to go. It's the greatest starting point of, of most lighting scenarios and we can just start to sort of try to be creative from there. But Three Point Lightning is usually where I start most my cinematic in interview setups and YouTube videos for that example. Key light, hair light up here, fill light, even have some practicals. Yeah, you get the point. I really 
enjoyed making this video. I would even enjoy more listening to you if you felt I missed something, your experiences when it comes to shooting cinematic interviews, anything you would want me to cover in a future video, please let me know in the comments. I answer all comments and I love to discuss that more with you. Please consider subscribing as well. If you have come this far, you might as well just subscribe or don't or watch this video or don't. See you in the next one.